Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to discuss a topic that we get a fair number of questions about the dividend discount model. I found that there's a lot of contradictory information about it and a lot of confusion about when to use it, when not to use it, when it's useful and when it's not so useful. So with technical questions and preparing for technical interviews, my advice is always the same. Focus on knowing the core concepts very well and skip the bells and whistles. So this really means for investment banking, accounting, the financial statements, valuation, DCF analysis, and a bit about deal modeling, such as M&A deals and leverage buyouts. Now, we get a lot of questions actually about more exotic methodologies, such as the dividend discount model, mostly from people who want to go above and beyond and over-prepare. They think that the DCF is boring. They find that valuation multiples are too simple or there's not much interesting to say about them. So they ask us questions about methodologies like the dividend discount model. So I will explain where these questions come from and answer the most common ones here. If you want this tutorial in writing, along with the screenshots, the Excel model, and all the company documents, go to this URL, mergersandacquisitions.com slash dividend discount model, or just search for MI dividend discount model. I'll also pin this in the comments so you can access it from there. As always, I'm gonna give you the short, simple answer first. And then if you want more detail and you wanna watch for more than a few minutes, you can go beyond this and keep watching and see me go through a bunch of these steps in Excel. The short answer about the dividend discount model though is as follows. The main rationale for using it is that when you buy a company's stock, you profit based on the company's dividends and then potential share price increases. If you think about metrics like unlevered free cash flow, which we've covered in this channel extensively before, they don't actually correspond to anything in real life. No company distributes its unlevered free cash flow to investors. No company retains its unlevered free cash flow. It's a bit of an artificial metric that doesn't correspond to much that happens in real life. Therefore, it's most logical to value a company by projecting and discounting its dividends and its future share price or projecting its equity value in the future and discounting it back to present value and then summing those up to see what the company might be worth today. So the dividend discount model does this exact approach. It projects and discounts the company's dividends and then also its future share price and sums them up to get its present value today. And it works best for companies that distribute dividends predictably using most of their available cash flows, or at least a significant percentage of their available cash flows. The dividend discount model is best for banks and insurance firms. And there, it's actually the main valuation methodology. It can also be useful for some real estate investment trusts or REITs and some MLPs or master limited partnerships in the oil and gas space. We're going to look at an example like that here. The reason it works so well in these industries is because Either the companies have regulatory capital that they need to manage to in the case of banks and insurance firms, so they need to maintain a certain amount of equity and dividends help them reduce or increase the amount of equity that they have at any given time. And then with REITs and MLPs here, there's often either a legal requirement or, or some type of soft requirement to issue dividends and investors have just come to expect it over time. So these are the industries where it's most applicable. Now you can also set it up for mature companies that have predictable cash flow profiles and dividend policies. So for example, many power and utility companies are good candidates for the dividend discount model as well. It is a bad idea for tech startups, for biotech startups, and anything else in the growth category that has unstable cash flows. The biggest issue with the dividend discount model is that it's very difficult to actually set up properly. It's much harder to use and to make assumptions for than the standard DCF and it requires more understanding of the company, including its capital structure. If you want to ignore my warnings and set it up anyway, step one in a dividend discount model is to forecast the company's revenue and expenses as you would in a standard DCF. So if you go to the Excel file here for this company, DT Midstream, you can see that the beginnings of the dividend projections here are very similar to what you do for a standard DCF, revenue, expenses, operating income. But then where it starts to diverge is everything that happens below operating income. And so in step two, you calculate the distributable cash flow and you assume that some of this is distributed in the form of dividends, some is spent on growth in the form of capex, and then some is retained in the form of cash. And so you can see down here that unlike in a standard DCF, we actually deduct the interest expense and various other items. So we add the equity investment earnings, for example, we get to pre-tax income, we tax affect it to get to net income. So we actually go to net income down here and then we calculate distributable cash flow by adding back many non-cash expenses. We also deduct maintenance capex because that's required for the company to keep operating. And then 
out of this distributable cash flow, we make an assumption. We say that the company distributes 38% or 40% in the form of dividends. And then maybe it spends 90% or 50% in the form of growth capex. And then the rest is retained as cash. And if there isn't enough left over to do that, then the company has to issue debt. So this is the core principle behind a dividend discount model in an industry like this. Now, once you have that, you project the changing cash and debt balances and the net interest expense. Now, the changing cash and debt balances can come from these projections because cash just equals the old number plus anything that the company has accumulated or retained. And then the debt balance is the old number plus anything that it had to issue. And then we can make some simple assumptions here for the interest rates on both cash and debt. And then the last step is to discount and sum up the dividends based on the cost of equity and then calculate and discount the terminal value and add it to those discounted dividends. So if you go up to the top, you can see that here I am taking the terminal value here. I'm basing it on a PE multiple because the dividend discount model is an equity value based methodology. I've calculated the cost of equity over here. We're not using WAC. We're using cost of equity because this is equity value based. And then I have just discounted the terminal value to present value based on that discount rate in a 10 year period. And then I'm using the NPV function to take the present value of all the company's dividends in this forecast period. I'm adding them up, dividing by the share count, and then comparing it to the company's current share price. And as you can see, this analysis shows the company is quite undervalued currently. So these are the basic steps involved in setting up a dividend discount model. Now, if you want more detail and you wanna keep watching, I will go through each of these steps in a bit more detail after this. So the plan here is to start with the revenue, expense, and cash flow projections for this company, DT Midstream. Then we'll go into the distributable cash flow calculations. Then we'll look at the debt, cash, and interest projections. Then we will go through the present value of dividends, the terminal value, and the implied value. And then we'll discuss the merits and drawbacks of the dividend discount model and whether it is actually reliable in this case. Let's start with the revenue and expense forecasts. For an oil and gas pipeline company like this, the revenue is based on the capacity, which could be in barrels of oil or barrels of oil equivalent for an oil-based company or billions of cubic feet for a natural gas-based or natural gas-dominant company times the per unit fees. So if you go in and look at what I'm doing for revenue here, we have the daily capacity. This is in billions of cubic feet per day. This is the throughput of all the company's pipelines. I've multiplied by the number of days in the year to get the total annual capacity. And then here, we are just doing some rough math and taking the total revenue and then dividing by the total annual capacity to figure out how much companies and clients are paying the company to use its pipelines, the average fee per billion cubic feet equivalent. And I have average fee, fee here twice. Let me just delete that. You can see this fee grows over time and then the pipeline capacity also grows over time. And so the company's revenue by the end is growing at around five or 6% per year based on both of these. Now on the expense side, a lot of these expenses, as I say here, operations, maintenance, and so on are all tied to capacity and they are generally going to increase over time. So operations and maintenance, depreciation, amortization, non-income taxes, these are all based on the capacity and they're all increasing very modestly over time. The overall goal is that you don't want the company's operating margin to change too much unless there's a really good reason for it to happen. So we start in this range of about 48 to 55% and we end in this range just at about 48% in the final year. With CapEx, you have to split it into maintenance and growth for this type of company. And here we are a bit lucky because if you go to the company's earnings presentations or some of their earnings called transcripts even, they do provide some estimates for what this should look like. So here, for example, in this model, I've relied pretty heavily on page 19 of this presentation where they give you an estimate for the growth capex and the maintenance capex. And based on that, we can then go in and we can set up some assumptions for the capex. We know how much the company's capacity has changed over time, and we know how much they've spent on growth capex over time from previous presentations. So based on that, we can then say, if they spend 600 or $400 million on capex, how much capacity growth is that gonna generate? How many new pipelines will they get? How much additional throughput will they get from that? And then with the maintenance capex, we can also link this to total capacity and just say that they need to spend a certain amount to maintain their existing pipelines. There is a question here about how much growth capex should boost capacity. And I have to be honest with you, the data here is not great. It's a bit all over the place if you actually look at the numbers, but 
I've tried to make reasonable estimates and I've been relatively conservative here and picked numbers toward the bottom end of the range, historically, for the most part. So that is a little bit about the revenue and expenses and how you can get to operating income or EBIT down here and how you can also project the growth and maintenance capex. With the growth capex, the other thing I wanna mention is that these numbers are all coming from another presentation where the company mentions its exact spending plans. So we don't really need to think about too much here because if you go to the investor presentation, I'll show you the slide this is on, they actually tell us right here that they're planning to spend about $1.7 to $2.2 billion over the next four to five years. So that's where all the growth capex numbers here are coming from. And then after this, we start to vary it a little bit more and we make it a percent of the company's distributable cash flow instead. Now, the second step of this process is the distributable cash flow. And the basic idea is that you take the company's net income, you add back non-cash expenses, you add dividends from equity investments, and then you subtract maintenance capex. And this tells you what the company can distribute, put back into growth, or retain as cash. Now, if you're wondering where all these numbers are coming from and how I got to this calculation, the answer is that the company discloses its distributable cash flow numbers in its investor presentations. So literally all I did here to get these numbers in Excel was go in and look up the number in earnings call transcripts and get their exact build from right here. And I'm just doing exactly what they did. So that's where this is coming from. With some of these, we have to make some additional assumptions. So for example, the equity investment earnings and the equity investment dividends, the cash interest and the cash taxes, things like that. So there are some additional assumptions involved, but at a very basic level here, we are starting with net income and we are mostly adding back depreciation and amortization, which boosts this by a huge amount because this is always non-cash. We're deducting only the maintenance capex, and then we're making some adjustments for other things like cash versus book taxes, for example. The key point, and what a lot of people will get wrong, is that you need to split up this distributable cash flow into dividends, growth capex, and cash retained. And if you go down and look at the formulas here, you'll see how I did it. The dividends we're assuming are a percent of this distributable cash flow. It goes up to about 45% over time. And somewhere in the presentation, the company also has this goal of maintaining at least a 2x coverage ratio for the dividends. And that's what we've done here, meaning that the distributable cash flow is at least twice as high as the dividends. The growth capex fluctuates a lot historically. Going forward, I've sort of kept this in the 35% to 40% range, something like that. And then the cash retained is just the delta. We take the distributable cash flow, we deduct the dividends, we deduct the growth capex, and that gives us how much cash we have left over. In one year, we don't have enough cash, so the company has to issue new debt. But in all the other years, we're perfectly fine and we don't actually need to issue new debt. The debt handles the case where the company spends more cash than it actually has on hand. This is probably the number one most common mistake with the dividend discount model. People ignore the payout versus growth versus retention assumptions. This comes up with banks and insurance firms in a somewhat different way, but it also comes up with MLP companies like this oil and gas pipeline company all the time. Let's go to part three and talk about the capital structure now. So the cash, generally speaking, should stay in a pretty tight range and grow as the company's revenue and capacity grow. The debt, we can see a modest reduction over time. Here, with both the cash and debt, I think that we are seeing changes that are too extreme. So the cash here goes from 61 million all the way up to about 1.8 billion by the end of 10 years. Now it's reasonable to think that the cash will grow by some amount. Maybe it goes up to two or three or 400 million or something like that, but this is too much. The debt meanwhile goes up very slightly, but the debt to EBITDA for the company starts at 5X and then it declines to about 2X by the end because we just don't need debt for all that much. We draw on it one year, but for the most part, we don't really need debt to fund dividends or growth CapEx or anything like that. Now, if you look at the company's investor presentation, let's just go back and I'll show you where they disclose some information about this. So they say that they are planning to deleverage. Oh, by their math, they're currently at around 4x debt to EBITDA, but they're using different numbers for EBITDA. So they are planning to deleverage, but we have a much more aggressive output here. So something appears to be a little bit off with their numbers, but that is about the best we can do in a quick analysis for now. With the interest rates here, the basic idea is that both rates go up. The rate on the cash balance and also the rate on the debt as existing debt matures, the company needs to issue new debt, they do so at higher rates, and then eventually the rates start falling once again because rates will probably come back down from their current levels at some point in the future. 
And then other items like the non-cash interest and the deferred taxes can just be simple percentages. So here we're making cash taxes a percent of book taxes, and we're keeping it fairly high because the company has not paid much historically in cash taxes, but we don't think this is going to persist indefinitely into the future. So we increase this to about 50% by the end. So that's a bit about the capital structure. Let's go to the present value of terminal value and dividends now. So the cost of equity, as always, is based on the risk-free rate plus the equity risk premium times levered beta. One note here is that if you look at this company, DT Midstream, their levered beta was around 0.8 at this time, but I looked at the comparable companies and they all had higher numbers. So I've actually increased this to 1.0. And so our discount rate is between 9% and 10%. I have a note about that here. The terminal value, you can use either the growth rate method and with a dividend discount model, you're going to base it on a net income growth rate. And you're going to look at a PE multiple for the multiples method, because again, this is an equity value based methodology. And then for the dividends, you can use the NPV function and the cost of equity for the discount rate. I showed you this earlier actually, but you can see it all set up right here. And that gets us to the implied equity value. Note that there is no equity value to enterprise value bridge here because the dividend discount model calculates the equity value directly. So when you set it up properly, it gives you the implied equity value. And so there's no need to create a bridge. If we wanted to, sure, we could go in and then calculate the implied enterprise value, but it would be completely pointless because ultimately we care about what this company's shares are worth. So there's no need to create any type of bridge here, which is one small advantage of this methodology. The overall conclusion is that the company seems quite undervalued based on our analysis. It seems like they're undervalued by about 50% based on the baseline output here. And if you go down to the sensitivity tables, you can see that in pretty much all regions of this table, no matter what the discount rate is, no matter what the terminal multiple is, it seems like their implied share price is above their actual share price of around $49 currently. And the same goes for this table. Even if we assume that this company has a negative terminal growth rate, it seems like according to our assumptions, they are still somewhat undervalued, even if you assume a much higher discount rate, say 11%, a negative terminal growth rate, they're still slightly above their current share price. So the question then becomes, is this model useful and how much do we believe the results? There are definitely some issues here. I've already pointed out some of them. The cash goes to too high a level, the debt barely changes, the capacity growth numbers we think are a bit questionable because the numbers have jumped around so much historically. That said, yes, I would say this company does seem at least somewhat undervalued. I don't know if it's 50% undervalued, but sure, 10, 20, 30%, something like that is easily possible here. This result is actually a bit unusual because for most companies, the dividend discount model tends to produce lower values than the standard DCF. That happens because dividends are by definition less than distributable cash flow. And they're also less than metrics like unlevered free cash flow and levered free cash flow because remember, dividends represent only a portion of these different cash flow metrics. So they're only a percentage of these. And therefore, if you're discounting and adding them up and valuing a company based on that, they're always going to be less than the actual cash flow metrics. Also, the cost of equity is normally greater than or equal to WAC, but the terminal value isn't necessarily higher to compensate. So just because we calculate terminal value based on net income or PE multiple, that doesn't mean that it's going to be higher than terminal value calculated based on an EBITDA multiple or the unlevered free cash flow growth rate, for example. So for most normal companies, you do tend to get lower values from the dividend discount model. There are some exceptions. If the payout ratio is high, if the terminal value is much higher, maybe this won't happen, but this is generally the case with most standard companies. I'd say though that the biggest issue is that it's very difficult to get the cash and debt assumptions correct and also to get the distribution growth and retention assumptions correct. I already pointed to the issues in our model. It's also quite difficult to send the check what you're doing in a lot of cases. We were fortunate that this company, DT Midstream, gives a lot of information on this, but I looked at probably five to 10 other midstream companies creating this tutorial, and a lot of them had almost no information on some of these very important details. That's about it. So let's do a quick recap and summary. We started by going through the revenue, expense, and cash flow projections for DT Midstream. For a pipeline company like this, the revenue is going to be based on the pipeline capacity times some type of fee for the throughput. So the clients pay them a certain amount to actually use their pipelines to transport their oil and gas. Expenses are all linked to capacity, and CapEx is, is divided into growth 
and maintenance, and we got the growth numbers and the maintenance numbers from the investor presentation. Then we calculated distributable cash flow. This is basically net income. You add back the non-cash expenses, you deduct maintenance capex, and then you add in things that might contribute to this, such as dividends from equity investments, for example. Once you have that, then you make an assumption about how much goes to dividends, how much goes to growth capex, and how much the company retains in cash. For the debt, cash, and interest here, the main issue is that the cash goes up to too high a level, and then the debt stays about the same, and so the debt to EBITDA for the company falls by quite a bit. This is not unusual. We just need to refine the numbers a bit more and maybe do some more research to get a better handle on what should happen here. We do think interest rates are gonna go up, which will affect things, but then they'll probably decrease in the long term. So this deserves some more attention and time if we had it, but this is just a quick and simple analysis. Then we calculated the PV of dividends, the terminal value and the implied value. And I showed you how based on the sensitivities, it does look like this company is at least somewhat undervalued, although we can debate the exact percentage. And then finally, we discussed the merits and drawbacks of the dividend discount model. In some ways, it is good because it is based on reality more closely or more so than a standard DCF, but it's very difficult to set up and use correctly. The assumptions are more difficult to come up with. You need to understand the company's capital structure in a lot more detail. And in a lot of cases, companies don't really disclose enough information for you to use this properly. So that is our overview of the dividend discount model. Hopefully now you understand more about it, when it's useful, when it's not so useful. It is also completely different for banks. So you can check out our coverage for the bank dividend discount model there. And as I said before, you can get all the files and resources at the URL shown on screen and pinned below this video.